charge! <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about bayonets. I know I've spoken quite a bit in the past about um, bayonets, but I want to actually talk specifically about this um, practice bayonet um, and, well, rifle and bayonet, um, which dates to around the First World War. Um, and it has, characteristically, you've probably, most of you who watch my channel have probably seen this before, a spring plunger. Okay, now I have taken this to my class um, a couple of times and we very gingerly um, uh, kind of practiced with its um, sword versus bayonet but we've used a nylon um, sword fairly carefully so that we don't damage this because it, it is a hundred year old antique. It does date to the First World War. Um, now, what I really want to talk about is why it's difficult to get replicas made sometimes. So. We would very, very much like to get a proper replica of these practice rifle and bayonets because we'd love to do, we'd love to have a better simulator basically. We do do a bit of bayonet versus bayonet and we do a little bit of sword versus bayonet but the simulators that we use are not really ideal but there are a few problems. First of all, Quite obviously, if you're going to stab someone with something, you have to have something that gives way and absorbs some of that energy. This is a heavy old object, okay? It's, um, it weighs the same as the rifle with bayonet fitted, or in fact, it's a tiny bit lighter. Um, but it weighs, uh, all of these weigh in the kind of eight or nine pound range, okay? So they are heavy weapons. They're, you're talking about a weapon that's as heavy as a pole axe or a halberd. Um, and if you're jabbing it into someone, um, then very clearly you need to have some type of mechanism that absorbs that shock. Otherwise, you're gonna break your training partners. Um, now, there are two main ways historically of doing that. One is to have some type of retracting bayonet, okay? Now, there were two main um, design types that did that. One was what you see here, and this was the type that kind of, through the evolution, survived. Through survival of the fittest, this was the mechanism that survived because it's the strongest, in a way, the simplest, and, um, but mostly because it's the strongest and is less likely to break in practice. Um, and in this, the rod goes inside the barrel. Now, funnily enough, this was one of the first types to be tried, um, although more rudimentary than this. The first ones they did, they actually got a ramrod um, and they got a spring and they welded a spring to the end of the ramrod and chucked it down the, the barrel of an old musket. Yeah, that kind of works. The problem is it'll pop out the end, so you need to make some kind of captive um, not mechanism, but some kind of um, catch or something at the top that stops the, the ramrod or the rod flying out. This is specially made object. This obviously isn't an actual rifle and is not is is much more substantial than a ramrod. Um, and this is a rod inside an, a, a tube with a spring inside, um, a dampened spring, incidentally. Um, so it's all quite uh, constant um, force all the way up and down. It doesn't sort of get harder and harder and then kind of shoot back out hard because that would be quite dangerous in itself. Um, the other method uh, of the spring type was where the, you actually had a socket bayonet that came out um, of a, a sort of neck at the side, like you'd have on a real uh, musket and bayonet of the period, and there was a slot down the side of the barrel. So in fact, the mechanism inside was more or less the same, but essentially it slid up and down a slot at the side with the bayonet offsets to the side. Now you could say that that type is more uh, realistic to the actual bayonet and rifle or musket that was in use at the time. That's true. The problem is the durability and it makes it makes it more likely to break but also because the arm of the bayonet is stuck out at the side you're more likely to get it twisting and you're more likely to um, basically have the bit that's sliding up and down inside the barrel get jammed and stuck. So for durability and simplicity's case even though it's slightly less realistic to the original, to the real bayonet and rifle, it makes sense to have the, the bayonet actually going into the barrel in this case. Um, now the other type, so the one type was the spring plunger. The other type was a, essentially a flexible, if you imagine a foil or an epee, or indeed a feather, feather shirt, um, uh, like a hema sword, essentially a bayonet mounted to the side of the barrel and the bayonet flexed, okay? Now that actually seems quite simple. And I have to say, with modern materials, you could make that quite safely if you use something like nylon or perhaps even steel. Um, but if you use some flexible material that couldn't break very easily, mounted to the side of a, a wooden with metal weights um, rifle stock, that's probably 
the easiest way for a modern manufacturer to make a modern sparring bayonet. So I'm not claiming any copyright to this, I'm not claiming any, uh, any kind of designer's fees or anything. And this is the reason why. It's very difficult to get anyone today to make a decent bayonet um, trainer that weighs the same as a real rifle and bayonet. Um, and the reason is, if you look at this thing, it's made with the same technology and sort of machinery that they were actually making rifles. So, so the fact is that these were made by, this is probably a William Greener one, Greener who made rifles and shotguns um, and pistols. Um, it, it, this is made by a gun maker. And so all the gun makers did is that they simply made these using the same machinery and the same materials that they made guns with. The stock is solid walnut. Um, the the checkered um, kind of back strap, as it were, up here is very similar to on, well, it's somewhat different, but it's a similar-ish kind of thing to what's on the Martini Henry, although this is for the Lee Enfield, this particular um, dummy. Um, it's got a weight here to simulate the weight of the breech or the, the well, yeah, the breech and the, the lock mechanism. Um, and then the barrel is a large steel tube, just like an actual gu gun barrel is. So the problem is a lot of companies today um, making HEMA equipment are used to making things like swords or sticks. They're not used to making guns. Um, but of course, gun companies today don't make guns in the same way. Um, I suppose some do. Some, you know, Pedasoli and Uberti and companies like this, Pieta, are making uh, historical firearms. So maybe they're the right people to approach. But I suspect they'd end up being very expensive, unfortunately. Um, so basically, it would be great if we could get some kind of accurately weighted and sized and shaped bayonet simulator and it's really difficult to do. So what this video is mainly is to point out that problem, explain the problem and see if you've got any ideas of people, of companies that we could approach who might be able to make, if not this, then something that would achieve the same goals. It needs to be the same weight, so about nine pounds of gun, um, with the same balance, so the balance point should be more or less where the front hand would go where you're, when you're shooting. Okay, um, and not just balance, but weight distribution as well. Um, and it should very importantly have a, um, either a plunger or a flexible bayonet, whichever actually, either could work um, with, a, with a safe tip on it. Now, and it has to be able to be hit by swords. So ideally we'd love to use this or a replica of it against steel sabers without worrying that either the saber or the, or the rifle is gonna fall apart in our hands. Uh, so it has to be fairly durable as well. But there's another issue. And that's why, that's another reason why I said that we have tried using this gingerly, carefully. One is that it, 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 we, it's an antique, so we don't want to break it, we don't want to damage it, we just want to you know, have a little experimentation with it, which is why we use the, the um, nylon or plastic bladed swords. But the other factor is this can hit really, really hard. Now, whilst it's relatively safe in this way, if you hit someone with it like this, and this is where you have to have training and discipline. The fact of the matter is, if you're wearing, uh, if, sorry, if you're wearing, if you're using an eight or nine pound object, regardless of what materials you make it of, you could do an enormous amount of damage to someone by just hitting them in the head with it. So if, for example, um, I stab at someone, they parry my stab off and they charge in to try and grapple me and I just go BAM in their face with my butt, if I stick my butt right in their face, um, then this is this happens to be on this example, a solid lump of steel on the end of a solid lump of walnut. So that is gonna have exactly the same effect on their fencing mask, which they'll be wearing, as if I hit them with an actual rifle butt. It's gonna put them flat on the floor. If I hit them in the chest or in the groin with it, it's just gonna be horrible, man. It's gonna be really messy. Um, so the fact is that actually, even with the fact that this is a supposedly a safe simulator with a spring plunger, that is still a large, heavy lump equivalent to a pole axe, and you don't want to be hitting someone hard using usual kind of HEMA gear um, with something of that weight. You just can't do it. And it's the same reason why it's very difficult for us to simulate combat with weapons like pole axes or bills or halberds, because or even quarter staffs actually, quarter staffs which aren't that heavy but which have a huge amount of leverage. It's very, very difficult to do that safely, but 
We can do spear safely by using safe spear tips um, that compress or flex. And it's the same thing with this. So it would be fantastic if we could get a company that would either replicate these or make a, a, one of the other versions of, of the uh, bayonet fencing simulator. But even if we do that, and even if the company does it right, anybody using those would still have to exercise a good degree of uh, training discipline and caution when using them because otherwise you're just going to blap someone onto the floor and they're going to be going to hospital with concussion because um, these are serious big things anyway i hope that's been somewhat interesting by all means feel free to post your thoughts or even if you run a company you who thinks that they could make something like this and one final thing it has to be relatively affordable it can it has to be within the range of normal HEMA weapons absolutely i could go to a gun maker i could contact uberti probably and get uberti to make a copy of this but it would cost me so many hundreds of pounds it wouldn't be necessarily useful as a training implement because we'd only be able to get two of them which i suppose would be better than nothing and maybe that is something to try as a, as a last ditch but the perfect solution would be if someone could make something that would work as a realistically weighted bayonet simulator without breaking the bank and without breaking our training partners <laughs> anyway i hope this has been interesting post your thoughts um, and ideas contributions below or any other personal views. I know that some people in Sweden have more modern um, bayonet simulators that they use because they're more modern and they're not afraid to use the originals. I'm not a huge fan of those personally because they're quite short. And this is about as short as I'd want to go. This is World War One. I'd actually prefer an earlier 19th century length one, which would be up to the top of my head, basically. Um, but yeah, anyway, I will see you for the next video and post below, give us a like and subscribe if you haven't done already. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, T-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.